so we're going to talk about linear factors and zeros. We know what zeros are. We covered that last chapter. Zeros are where the y value is zero. Linear factor, though, we did not name it as this, but we know what a linear factor is. If I have x squared plus 5x plus 4, that is a quadratic trinomial. Using the classification words we talked about yesterday, that's a quadratic trinomial. It factors as x plus 4 times x plus 1. And so we use this terminology, linear factor, because we have two factors of our quadratic trinomial. And each of those factors are degree 1, and we call polynomials of degree 1 linear. <coughs> so that's what this terminology, linear factor, means, is you get factors that have degree 1, which is synonymous with linear. When you're told to factor a polynomial, the first thing you should try is GCF factoring. Here we can factor out an x, giving me x squared plus x minus 12. <coughs> so then all that's left is to factor this quadratic, which factors as what? So x plus 4 times x minus 3. Again, just taking note that this factor is degree 1, this factor is degree 1, this factor is degree 1. So we have this down to nothing but linear factors. Questions there? Wait, did you count? Mr. Shearhart. Really? Linear factors are degree 1. Quadratic. Our degree 2, cubic, our degree 3, and then quartic, degree 4. That's about as high as I think we need to worry about right now. Linear, quadratic, cubic, quartic. Why is it called a... So the first part of this question, very straightforward. What are the zeros? They've provided us this cubic polynomial already in its factored form. We just have three linear factors. One, two, three. What are the zeros then? We have three of them. The zeros, of which we have three. What makes this zero? Positive three. What makes this zero? Negative four. What makes this zero? Positive one. So then we want to graph this. We have zeros at 3, 1, and negative 4. And so we have to remember the definition of zero <clears throat> so that we understand that these being zeros mean that's where it crosses the x-axis. What would be the end behavior of this polynomial? So we look at all of these. When I multiply these three linear factors together, I'm going to get y equals something x cubed. What is this coefficient going to be when I multiply these three linear factors <coughs> together? To get this term, it's going to be x times x, which gives me x squared, and then it's going to be that x squared times x, which gives me x cubed. There will be no other term when I multiply these together. There will be no other term that's third degree. So the leading coefficient is actually positive 1. So I know that the end behavior of this polynomial is what? A positive leading coefficient, like what we have here, means we're going to be going up on the right and down on the left. So when I ask you to graph something like this, I'm more concerned with plotting the zeros specifically, boom, 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 and then getting the end behavior correctly. So on the left, we're going to be going down. So this is going to look something like that. Okay? I'm not going to be overly concerned with getting these points specifically where they're supposed to be. 
primarily because I'm going to assume, and this is safe for most of you, that you would be able to use your calculator to find out exactly what these points should be. And we tested that last chapter, so blah. We take these zeros, and I need linear factors. Since there are three zeros, I need three linear factors. And I need linear factors so that if I plug these numbers in, those linear factors would equal zero. So in this problem, it would be x minus 1 corresponds to that. x plus 1 corresponds to that. And x minus 4 corresponds to that. So y equals x minus 1 times x plus 1 times x minus 4. Now they ask for this in standard form. If the question was, what is a cubic polynomial with functions one, with zeros 1, negative 1, and 4, you could stop here. That is a cubic polynomial function with zeros 1, negative 1, and 4. But they have this piece in there in standard form, which means we have to multiply all of this out. So what is x minus 1 times x plus 1? These two, I did not mean to do that, these two are conjugates. So when you FOIL conjugates, you just have to worry about the first, x times x, and the last, negative 1 times 1. So they made life a little bit easier on us here by making them conjugates. To finish the problem, we have to multiply these together. These are obviously not conjugates. So we will have to FOIL these. What do we get when we FOIL those? So y is x cubed minus 4x squared minus x plus 4. You do have to make sure it's in standard form, meaning that the degrees descend by 1 each time, if they're all present. But it has to be in descending order, and this one <laughs> is. So that's our answer. In this problem, you are asked for the zeros and the multiplicities. The multiplicities. So, to define multiplicities, or to give you an example, if I have y equals x minus 2 squared, which is the factored form of the quadratic x squared minus 4x plus 4. That quadratic looks like this with the point 2, 0. So what we say is we have a 0 of x equals 2 with multiplicity 2 which we mentioned this idea last chapter, we referred to this as a double root. All multiplicity means is how many times do we count it, right? Quadratics, we said, always have two roots. So if it only hit the graph at one point, we'd say that the zero was x equals two with multiplicity two because we count it twice. The other way to think about it is if in the factored form of your polynomial, your linear factor is squared, you're going to have multiplicity 2. If your linear factor is cubed, you'd have multiplicity 3. If your linear factor is to the fourth, you have multiplicity 4. That's what multiplicity means. So up here, what are the zeros of this function? What are the multiplicities? How does the graph behave at these zeros? When you graph this in the calculator, it's going to look something like this. more or less. You're going to cross here, and you're going to hit here. The zeros are x equals negative 1 and x equals 3. Now here's an idea with polynomials. Whatever the degree of the polynomial, okay, and this one is degree 3, whatever your degree is, you have exactly that many zeros. You have to have 3. You'll see that 
we've only written down two numbers. You can see the graph only hits the x-axis in two spots. We have to have three. Graphically, just like down here in this example, if this is how it hits the x-axis, then that's a double root right there. So we have negative 1 has a multiplicity of 1, 3 has a multiplicity of not 3 at all, has a multiplicity of 2. So we count this 0 once, we count this 0 twice, giving us my total of 3 zeros, 3 roots, 3 solutions. All right, between the graph and our zeros here, we know that f of x is going to factor as x plus 1 times x minus 3 squared. And so this is where the multiplicity is coming from. The factored form, you have a 0 of negative 1 with multiplicity 1. You have a 0 of positive 3 with multiplicity 2. Right now, the thing I would expect you to know is that graphically, if it comes down and just hits the x-axis in one spot and then takes off again, that's multiplicity 2. We're going to talk later in the chapter about how to get to this point. Like a change in direction. And that's what they're going after in this how does the graph behave at these zeros. If it crosses the x-axis, it's got multiplicity 1. If it hits the x-axis but does not cross it, we say it's multiplicity 2. Later on in the chapter, we're going to discuss how to factor like this, because at least for me, the whole idea of multiplicity is a lot clearer if you have the factored form, right? This is multiplicity 1, this is multiplicity 2. From the factored form, it's very easy to see. We have our fun little video here. I have graphed this function in here. I'm a good polynomial. <laughs> You're welcome. Now, relative maximum minimum. This function does not have a maximum, nor does it have a minimum, because we know the end behavior without graphing it, but obviously since we've graphed it, we can tell this is going to go down forever and ever and ever. This is going to go up forever and ever and ever based on what we know about end behavior. Odd degree means they go opposite directions. Positive leading coefficient means it goes up on the right, down on the left. So there is no maximum or minimum. But relative maximum, relative minimum mean if you just look at some portion of the graph, is there a maximum or minimum on that portion of the graph? Holy moly. If you just look at this portion of the graph right here, there's going to be a maximum at the top. If you just look at this portion of the graph right here, there's going to be a minimum down here at the bottom. So to find the relative max, relative min, we want to find the point that's at the top here is the relative max, point at the bottom here is the relative minimum. Okay, that's what I got. It says round to the nearest tenth. So we say that our maximum is 10. 0.4, minimum is negative 10.4. Okay? Because the maximum minimum values are always asking about the y's. If they asked where do they occur, then they want the x values. So, for example, the minimum value occurs at an x value. Okay, my minimum occurs at an x value of 1.7 my maximum occurs at an x value of what? Who got that one? 1.7. Negative 1.7, which is my assumption. With cubics like this, as long as it goes through the origin, which this one does, you can see on the graph it crosses through the origin, this is how things will work out. You'll have negative 1.7, 10.4, positive 1.7, negative 10.4. That's called symmetry through the origin. If you have symmetry through the origin, then your first point, x, y, you will also have on the graph a point that is, what's that, negative x, negative y. That happens if you have an odd polynomial that goes through the origin.
The first step in a word problem is to read it, so read the problem. So we know that the length plus the width plus the height is 12. That is in reference to our rectangular prism that we remember from geometry. What else do we know? We know that the length is three times the height. What should each dimension be? What are they asking us to do? Right. Volume is length times width times height. We look here. Using those two equations, we know that 3h plus w plus h is 12. So 4h plus w is 12. So w is 12 minus 4h. This and this help because we can take those to our volume equation and say now we have volume is 3h times 12 minus 4h times h. So I plug these in. The Apple TV froze up. Plug them in up there. There we go. Why do we have to plug into volume like this? Why do we have to do this? So you put this in for y1 and you maximize it. So in the interest of time, I'll just tell you, if you calculate the maximum, h should be 2. And the units we're using here are inches. If h is 2, you plug in here and here. Length should be 6 inches. Width should then be 4 inches. Those add up to be 12 and give us a maximum volume. And make sure to answer the question they ask. They're asking, what should each dimension be? They could also ask, what is the maximum volume, which would be 6 times 2 times 4. Just make sure you answer the question that they've asked.